I start by just thanking everybody for being here and for the kind invitation and the hospitality of wonderful people from a wonderful country. And it's my hope and prayer that what I'm going to talk about today and to bring to India will provide your people, your companies, but most of all, your younger folk with opportunities for the next 20 years. And may those opportunities live perhaps even longer than me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Howard Moskowski went to Queens College, Harvard, first job US Army. A great job, in the way it was described, to get soldiers to eat the right food with the right calories. He's worked with every single major food company in the world, PepsiCo included. Okay, he's won every single award in the field of market research. And I dare say that if there were an Oscar, he would be the first recipient of it. Okay. Howard, I have five questions for you in our 25 odd minutes. First, as a scientist, what got you started in this area? And how did business people react to these you know, new ideas that you brought to them? I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not as polished as the truths you've heard before is the wonderful words. I got started at Harvard. I was told by my professor, Howard, you're not an electroniker. That means you don't really know AC from DC and get off my equipment. I don't want you to burn out my transformers when you do work on the hearing. Howard, why don't you do something that you can do, like taste or political polling? And uh, I was uh, 23 at the time, and I heard the word taste. And so I realized nobody knew anything, and if I was going to get out of Harvard with a PhD, I might do taste. And therefore, I did work on taste. And uh, that's the start of my career. The end of my career now, I'm almost 73. It's political polling, and we'll talk about that later. I was in part responsible for Mr. Trump's victory. So I've taken out extra insurance coming to India just in case there are a variety of Democrats. I also have a New York City sense of humor. Uh, one has read a lot about food optimization, a concept that uh, you enunciated. What does it mean and how does it apply to a country like India and what can yes. we learn from it? Well, that's a wonderful thing. First of all, I want to thank you from Pepsi because it was Pepsi Cola in 1974 with my uh, associate Barry Jacobs. And uh, I came to Pepsi when I was a government scientist uh, after a meeting with the American Society of Testing and Materials. And Barry Jacobs said, we have some problems. Do you think you can go to the R&D facility in Long Island City and explain to us how we might make better products? make it closer because uh, my voice doesn't carry. Otherwise, I'd have to yell. So I said, OK, let me go to Long Island City. And they were very kind. And in fact, I said, the only way I know how to make a better product is to systematically vary the ingredients. And this is very important. Vary what is under your control scientifically, highs and mediums and lows. And Barry and Archie Porter were there, head of R&D. They did it, and it worked. We got some winning products. And from that, I realized that companies, no matter how large they are, Unilever, Pepsi Cola, General Foods, Procter & Gamble, really did not know how to make products better. They had a lot of data on their products but they never systematically created different new test products, evaluated them, and built models. So to answer your question, uh, Pepsi accepted it. Unilever accepted it. I was bodily thrown out of a variety of companies, many of which are here today. And I won't mention their names because it's embarrassing. But it was a mixed reaction. There were a number of companies that really accepted systematic variation and a lot of companies that did not. But every company, whether it was Pepsi 
or Tropicana. You've all had the orange juice with pulp, I think, uh, or Maxwell House Coffee. Any company which systematically did the experiments, which varied the products, ended up winners. That's how I got into the business. Give us how you developed both cherry vanilla Dr. Pepper, which was completely off the charts for Cadbury Schweppes, as well as Prego Chunky. What led you to, you know, really these rock buster innovations? Uh, well, first of all, they're not, I'm not an innovative person. I was, I was a scientist, I still am a scientist. And I simply was able to convince the people at uh, Cadbury Schweppes, Dr. Pepper, the people at uh, Campbell's Soup, Prego, to systematically vary the products. That was the biggest achievement. And once they made the different products and tested them with 50 or 100 people per product, they found out these remarkable developments. That's also something that I want to leave with India, that India can become a powerhouse all of the world's food companies, and in fact, many of the consumer product companies, not food, health and beauty aids, are what we say in America, sitting ducks. I like to repeat that in case I wasn't clear. All of the companies in the world, in food, many of them in health and beauty aids, are sitting ducks. That is to say, India can become a powerhouse of product development and design, not so much by outspending these companies as by doing simple experiments, the way I did it for Campbell's Soup. Understanding the ingredients, varying them systematically, and I, I have some papers to share with you. Testing these in combinations with consumers. I hope I'm not being too technical. Test these combinations with consumers, get the reactions, and understand the dynamics of the product. Can you imagine a country as great as India putting its companies through this training and letting them become powerhouses? It's all in your hands. So that's the positive words I have to say. The other big concept you're known for, Howard, is uh, mind genomics. Can you give us a 101 course on what this is? What is yes. mind genomics? Yes. Uh, that's the second half of my life. Uh, the first half was devoted to, it, and still is devoted to, making better products. But then I realized that there was something else going on. The people that I was coming in contact with, the younger people, weren't able to think quite strongly, quite creatively, quite critically. And so I realized that with God's gift of this science, that I'd have to not only spend time in the commercial world, but redevelop a science of thinking, a science of the mind. And so what I did is create a system by which you could figure out what's important in an area. And for example, take a, uh, a product like the uh, toothbrush. What happens when you put ideas together about mechanical movement and toothbrushing? You end up with new synthesis of ideas. And this became the mechanical toothbrushing industry. So mind genomics is simply putting together ideas, combining those ideas, testing them with consumers, getting at the reactions, and building a science of any topic, any experimental area from the bottom up. What it means is that any young person today can learn to think critically. It's a simply mind genomics is simply a method for understanding how ideas fit together. Imagine a kid 10 years old, or 12 years old, or 15 years old, becoming a scientist. It's the same kind of revolution as we had in the digital period when kids 10 years old were given computers. Let's give them something better. Let's give them the discipline to think. And that's what mind genomics is about. 
You mentioned millennials and I know that you, you have a book on it uh, also. Uh, a lot of people talk a lot about millennials. We do. We are a very young country, 330 millennials, uh, million millions in uh, here. Uh, we always talk about how different they are. But one of the things I really want to prove with you is what can we do for them? Well, the millennials. First of all, are they really different? Do they have different values? I don't want to say that they're different or not. What I do is I do the experiment. Remember this mind genomics. Take a topic like what kind of beverages. You're in the beverage business or what kind of foods. Mix and match ideas. Give these ideas to millennials and let's see what pops, what ideas pop. And let's build a machine of ideas that combines features for millennials. You'll find that the millennials are not as different as you think from the older people. They may talk differently, but there's just the same kinds of divisions among these millennials as there are in older people. But because companies don't do the science, you look at this new cohort of young people and you say, my God, they're all different. They're speaking a different language. They're not. They're really not too different. All you have to do is be able to speak with them and know what makes them tick, and it's not so different. We do work, for example, in wine. We thought that the millennials are very different in what they like. They're not different in what they like. They just will buy it differently. They respond to different messages. <clears throat> this is something that Howard did, which most people didn't expect. He went to 102 black people and asked them, what is it that you expect of the next president of America? And he said they expected the following. Lowering of taxes, wanted a strong leader, wanted to create more jobs, change the tax code, help small companies win, make college affordable, and improve the U.S. financial health. And Howard was one of the first people who said, you must vote for Trump and not Hillary Clinton. So I want to know what prompted you to do this, because in that article it said that Trump team refused to comment on this. Yes. Um, it was July 2016, and along with Mind Genomics, this effort to teach people how to think, we also have an effort called Vox Populi to use Mind Genomics to make governance open and visible to all people. And uh, we had one of the campaign people, Daniel Gulbinovich, from uh, Trump say, yeah, we'd be interested in seeing the issue. And the question we have is, what do we say to blacks, African Americans? And without their help, we got all the issues together. We used my genomics, mixing and matching these ideas, giving them to the blacks, getting responses from these combinations, and then figuring out exactly the kinds of elements that worked and not, and dividing the uh, black population, even with 100 people, not so much by who they were as by the way they thought. And from that, we were able to identify exactly what Mr. Trump should say. And if you look at Mr. Trump's actions, around Labor Day, the beginning of September, he all of a sudden went from being off strategy and talking about everything to talking for two weeks about facts, the facts that we gave him. And again, I'm an iconoclast, as you might be able to sense, and all of this is 10 to 15 years ahead of when it will be accepted, just like the work with Pepsi was 15 years ahead. So I don't expect to live to see the, the real implementation of mind genomics to help government or mind genomics to help the Indian youth think more critically and become powerhouses, but I'm planting the seed anyway. You didn't recommend the wall. Pardon me? You didn't recommend the wall to Mr. Trump. <laughs> well, Mr. Trump has got his own um, agenda and uh, would it surprise you to know that I'm apolitical? I'm really not interested in politics. I'm interested in, in people and a better world, 
but not at all in politics. Do you think the work you've done right now, predicting this, will have a big future in the political landscape of many other countries? I'm hoping, with God's help, that it will. I know that already in the United States, in, in the state of Wisconsin, they're seriously considering using this to help frame public policy. And I believe that once the citizens can see on a computer, on a, on a, on a table, uh, a statistical table, what are the ideas that are important, what are the ideas that are popular and not popular, they'll be able to be better informed.